Hey everyone, welcome to Group Tech. Some globe trotters come from Harlem, but this one in particular hails from New Zealand. I'm talking about Phil Kogan, the 10 time, which by the way is ridiculous. We're gonna get into what you do with 10 Emmys. The 10 time Emmy winning host of the wildly popular reality competition series, The Amazing Race, which just began and this I cannot believe it's 36th season on CBS with new episodes airing every Wednesday night at 9.30. It is a big world, and we have got a lot to talk about. Phil Kogan, welcome to Group Text. Well, thank you. I, I'm very interested to know more about where the name came from and uh, what your show is all about. And you said it's a very loose chat, so I presume we're going to be traveling all over the world metaphorically when it comes to topics of conversation. I love the fact that this is two people who are normally the ones asking the questions. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be battling the battle of the hosts. Yes. Because <laughs> we're all trained to default, or not trained, what we all do is default into discussing the other person. Right. And I'm used to seeing you on a red carpet. But first, you. Then you can ask me whatever you want. I see. Okay. Okay. I, I love the amazing race. I was an early adopter. Um, so many questions that everyone knows who you are, but I'm not sure that really people know a lot about you. And you, I read that you moved around a lot as a kid. Where do you consider your childhood home? When you think of home, where is that? Mm. Um, that's hard to say because um, I did move around a lot. Uh, I think childhood, I probably think of Antigua because I lived there for eight years from the age of six to 14. Um, I had a few years in Canada before that. And, um, my dad was lecturing at Guelph university in, in Ontario. Um, and then I went back to, to New Zealand, uh, where I was originally born to go to boarding school from 14. So childhood, probably I would say Antigua. That's, in, that's interesting. That's not the one I would have guessed. What did your father do that you guys were moving so much? Was he in the military? Was he an academic? Uh, he's a plant scientist, and my mom is a music teacher, and um, both have the equivalent of doctors doctorates in their, in their chosen profession. And so my dad got a posting down in Antigua to head up a, a research project in agriculture, and my mom got a position at a, the biggest high school in Antigua. She, uh, music teacher, she also taught typing, shorthand, commerce. So um, they're both, uh, they, they, it was sort of a unique thing to do. Like when I was a kid for, for people to travel the way they did. And during the time, you know, growing up, we lived in Colombia for a while. We lived in Trinidad for a bit, Australia. We just got around and that's where I really got my, the travel bug from was from my parents. Um, I remember one summer we drove some crazy distance in a Volkswagen Westfalia camper van with the pop-up roof and went to every national park in North America for, gosh, it must've been 12 weeks or something. My dad took a sabbatical. Um, so I, I've grown up traveling and the fact that I work on Amazing Race seems very fitting based on how I grew up and sort of what my first loves were. What were you doing right before Amazing Race? What was your, what brought you to LA? How did you get the job? What were you doing? So I started, it's not been, it's, it's not a straight tra trajectory. No, no, no. I started, I started in TV at 18 and I was what they call a film. Uh, sorry, I was a camera assistant. And um, so I started loading film and working. Uh, I always had an interest in photography ever since I was a little kid, I had a dark room. And then when I, at a Christmas party once when I was 19, they, they were auditioning for a, a long running show that had been on for a long, long time. And somebody didn't turn up and they put me in front of the camera. And anyway, lo and behold, I ended up on a network, primetime network show when I was only 19. There were three hosts, three of us, and then, um, and people would write in and get us to do adventures that they wanted us to do. Like, we want to see them go skydiving or we want to see them do whatever. So I, 
I started there and then um, I sold uh, my first show when I was very young. It was, uh, it was called Kogan's Heroes actually. And I profiled like extreme, um, extreme athletes. Anyway, I ended up in New York when I was, uh, I decided to come overseas and try my hand at getting work in front of a camera when I was quite young. So I arrived in New York, I was 23, 24. I had only been in New York, like I arrived in New York and didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about anything. And um, I ended up getting offered a job at MTV after only being in New York for two weeks on a music show. Only oh my to- God, <clears throat> you're an MTV vet also. Well, I got offered a job. After- I'm an MTV vet. Yes, I know. Well, I don't know if you remember back in the day, there, uh, Ted Demi, Jonathan mm-hmm. Demi's. Yep. Right. So he was auditioning, and this would have been 1992. Mm-hmm. And um, they had a music show. I think it was called MTV's Most Wanted. Mm-hmm. And um, and I had been hosting a show in New Zealand where I interviewed anybody who was famous who came to New Zealand. It was a show called 345 Live. It was a live daily live show, and we had. Any but like we had Skid Row, we had Guns N' Roses, we had uh, I, I remember Frank Marshall, I interviewed him. Uh, anybody who was famous, MC Hammer, just as M, uh, You Can't Touch This came out, I interviewed any everybody. Anyway, I come to New York, talk my way into an agency, go do this audition with Ted Demi, and I think the casting director's name was Julie Mossberg. And um, they asked me to pretend to interview UB40. And I had literally just interviewed UB40 in New Zealand on a show that I did there. So I was about to tell him, like, I can do that. I no. <laughs> so I, I, I ended up doing five auditions. I got the job only to find out that I couldn't take the job because I didn't have a visa. I couldn't get a visa unless I had a job. Um, I couldn't get a job unless I had a visa and all this stuff. So that began a whole journey of me trying to get a visa. And then I got my first real job at MT uh, at VH1, and I interviewed Linda Ronstadt, and I did a pilot. It was called Hollywood Hits, and then and then I got a job on um, in 1994 on Breakfast Time. Tom Bergeron was the host. Um, Larry Hibbard was the co-host. We had a puppet who was an ex Howard Stern writer, Alan Rosenberg, mm-hmm. and I did that show for three or four years. I went to every state in America doing stories live, all kinds of crazy stuff, changing a light bulb on the Verrazano Bridge, live skydiving, hand feeding sharks, live, uh, just like the most, it was the most incredible experience. I remember Gladys Knight was singing to me while I was underwater hand feeding sharks in the Bahamas, like just the craziest stuff. It was a really groundbreaking show. And then, um, That show ended after it went to Fox Network. And then I sold a show to Discovery, was called Phil Kogan's Adventure Crazy, based on my life list and my list of things to do before I died. And that was the show that I'd done just before Amazing Race. Um, So, yeah, that's sort of the journey of how it led up to. Which obviously was a perfect fit. Um, When it premiered, I mean, Survivor had already been on about three seasons when it premiered and you were already at this point a veteran host producer when did you guys know it was going to be a hit when did you have that moment like wow we've got something well we didn't know for quite a while so i was up for survivor it was between jeff and i for survivor that was it and and survivor premiered and on may 31st which is my birthday 2000 and at the end of that year, after Survivor had only been on one year, Les Moonves, who was the head of the network at the time. Yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> um, he he said that my name had come up a second time for for uh, at the network. And I got shortlisted for Amazing Race. And I, uh, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to be a bridesmaid again here on this thing because um, there was an issue with my accent. Being a New Zealander, it was a bit of a problem back then. In those days, you didn't have a lot of foreign accents. And my accent was kind of mixed up. Um, But anyway, I did get the job. And then we shot 
uh, only six months after the premiere of Survivor. We shot in January of 2001. Well, we premiered Amazing Race on September the 8th, 2001. Not great. A few days before 9-11. 9-11. And the idea of watching a show where people traveled around the world after 9-11 it was not really, you know, it, it almost derailed the show because like, who cares about watching people race around the world at a time when we've got this terrorist attack happening in, in America. So we did not know really that we had something super special, I guess, until probably maybe season three, because it took a little while to get going. And by the, then, then season three is the one that got nominated for the Emmy and then won the Emmy. And I think then people are like, oh, hold on a second. What's this show, this this amazing race show? So I do think that the Emmy really helped to make us a part of the zeitgeist and people, you know, we're not, uh, Amazing Race has never been one of those shows that's been a, like what you, you know, use train wreck type devices to, mm -hmm. devices to try to get attention. And there's been a lot of shows that have done that. You know, it's like, I always equate it to if you were to drive past a train wreck on the first day, everybody slows down rubbernecks and looks at the train wreck. But if if you're driving past that train wreck after three days, four days, five days, after a week, you're not even looking. You're just, right. you just drive straight by. And I, so I think we never relied on that as a way to get people to pay attention we just tried to make something that was good for families and good family viewing and that was consistent and was um, quality, a quality show. Right, but also fun and interesting. You've got, so you have teams yeah. and they have to have some sort of a relationship. What relationships fare, fare the best and what fare the worst? Okay, but let me preface this with. Yeah. At one point, it was approached that my mother and I would do it to, we could do it as a team. By the and way, I, I, I do want to just say how much of a fan I, I am of your mother's. I always loved listening to her on Howard Stern. I loved anything that you guys did together. Your mom was just like one of a kind. She was a um, a groundbreaker, a maverick. Um, so I just Thank want you. to acknowledge her because, man, talk about a just a raw talent. And I love that she still lives on. I love when Howard Stern opens the door and your mom comes back and has conversations. Um, Thank you. Yeah, really uh, special. So we had been approached. Yes, you would have been great it. together. No, we wouldn't have. A, we would have killed each other. Which yes, would have been exactly. great TV. Yes, I, I know what people TV. wanted. Yeah. I know what yeah. that is. But we, so she said to me, mm. you know, here's how we're going to do it. And I'm like, but mom, you can't like bring jewelry to bribe people with. You can't mm -hmm. do this. You can't do that. And she's, no, it's about the smarts. And I can outsmart everybody. I go, you also have to like run and hurry. Yeah. And she looked at me, she goes, Ugh, I'm not doing anything where you're going to be yelling at me that I'm not running fast enough. Mm. I don't run. I'm like, well, then we're not doing it. I said, I don't do, like when I did, I'm a celebrity. It's like, I go to win. And she's like, I can't like sneak stuff in. I'm like, no, that's not how it worked. And we pretty much realized that one of us would push the other one off the cliff and it would probably be me because I would have gotten there before her and she would have snuck up behind me and shoved me. And mm. we didn't think that, you know, murder was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> what groups fare the best which fare the worst yeah it's it's I, and I don't, I don't mean to be evasive but it's it, it's really hard to answer that question because we've seen very dysfunctional teams do really well and we've seen teams that really communicate really well and get on really well and respect each other in a way that is almost pandering you know where they've done really poorly I there isn't I mean, if there's one trait, I guess it's the fact that teams that do well are the ones that are consistent, even if it looks like they're not communicating well. I mean, you know this more than anybody. It's like, how do you ever judge why relationships work and why things work? Sometimes I look at couples that are together. I'm like, why are you guys together? And 
yet they are and they stick it out and other couples where you think everything is fine and then suddenly you find out they're breaking up and sometimes the spark and that and 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 that banter and that what looks maybe dysfunctional from the outside is actually highly functional <laughs> so have you had I was gonna say, have you had uh marriages or couples break up mid filming not break up but we've had definitely friction we did have um a separated couple come on the show meaning that they were they still liked each other very much but they were separated they were no longer technically a a couple or that's a lot romantic. to discuss in therapy yeah like no longer <laughs> a romantic couple but they had a child um yeah i mean it de definitely tests a lot of people are like oh we want to come on the amazing race because we really want to test our relationship i'm like you know, probably not a good place to test. If you're even thinking about testing, this is not the place to test it. <laughs> oh yeah, my fans like we can't even play pa pickleball together. Oh, we can't. It's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. And I, then I get great irritated. Game, by the way, right? Pickleball. Right. It's it's great. So but so much fun. I I get annoyed, and then he becomes more annoying just to push my buttons. Mm. And I go. And he, he's like, you know, he likes to see how long before I can blow up. So you travel all over the world, everywhere. Um, you have to have a lot of amazing, I mean, this was the first thing I wanted to ask you was travel hacks. Because traveling is, for everybody, a nightmare. What, if you could share one, first of all, if you're traveling by yourself and not traveling for work where you have a whole wardrobe, do you carry on or check? On, and, only carry on. And then you ship, the wardrobe is shipped through the company so it's not your your issue? Oh, when, when, when I'm on Amazing Race, I, I, I have one suitcase and I check it and it's the entire season's worth of wardrobe. But early on, like season one, they gave me two suitcases to carry and it was such a pain in the butt that I said, no way. I said, next season, everything has to go in one case and I'm carrying a backpack, that's it. So the wardrobe person gets one case and everything has to fit into that. Occasionally I have to send some stuff ahead because we're going to really cold places and we need extra, I need extra outfits for the cold. But generally speaking, if it doesn't fit in that one case, it's not going. What's your one must have on a plane? Like I have, like I, have to have lip balm oh and gum oh, wow and gum okay well gum uh, for the ears yeah i um i like i have this light travel jacket it's actually called jet lag the the jacket and it packs up really small um like like this small and i find it um a lot of times you can get on flights and it can get cool. Mm -hmm. And I like to be able to layer up and it's it's got feathers. It's like a little puffy jacket. Yeah, and I have so I have one like that. I love I love having that with me. Um earplugs, um, eye mask, um uh definites, um, a good book, um, a moleskin diary. I've been carrying one of those since high school. Really? Uh, yeah, I love Moleskin Diaries. I, I'm very tactile and love writing things down, writing notes, ideas. Um, but good, good um, reading material. And you know, if you can take a a movie or have some kind of content, then that's that's a, a bonus. Some okay, you've you've gone much deeper than me. If we're gonna play this game, I also have my travel blanket, mm -hmm. which folds up into a little like cashmere. I hate to say it case and then I take the yucky pillow from the plane put mm. that in my case and then use my blanket of course you have to have a good book that is not a travel hack I also well, not everybody not everybody thinks about that and then they find themselves stuck in an airport for hours and they haven't thought about it and then they they're suddenly like bored out of their brains I I, okay. I do not get bored traveling okay worst travel experience you've ever had I've got a good one that's hard to match. I well, I've had a few rough ones. I had it one night where I get held in Ukraine and in um in 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 immigration overnight and I had to sleep on some plastic seats and there was no light in the room, only light coming through some 
some doors and I couldn't see into the room and I didn't realize that I was actually in a room with a lot of other people. And when I woke up in the morning, I'd, I'd had to put myself between the plastic handles of these plastic seats and the seats were molded for the glutamus maximus area of the body. And so it wasn't flat and um, I was pretty uncomfortable. I had a pretty rough night. And when I woke up, I saw that I was in a room with like maybe 20 other people. I had no idea that they were in there. That'll and freak you out. It was a bit weird. And then thankfully, uh, the representative for the, the United States government who was there, I don't know if it, if she was the ambassador or whatever, she was a big fan of, of the Amazing Race and got me out. And then I ran straight from out of the airport to the pit stop. Um, that was not a pleasant night. But no, tell me I, yours. Okay. Um, now, what people know is I grew up traveling all over the world with my parents for work. So I've grown up, I know, just like you, I've grown up in airports and sleeping in the backs of cars and all that stuff. So we were taking a trip to, with friends, to the Galapagos. Oh. And our flight leaving LA got delayed. So we were delayed going into um, Miami. And we were going on like one of those expedition boats. And we thought we had left enough time. Turns out there was only one other group, which was a couple on the boat. So we'll get back to that. We land in Miami. All the flights to where we were having to land to pick up the boat canceled. Oof. Then they say they can't. Now we had checked luggage because we were going for a week to the Galapagos. They come, they tell us we can get you on another flight, but that would have made us miss the boat. So we're all panicking. We're this. The boat's saying they won't wait, even though there's another couple. We're like, can you pick us up somewhere else? Well, we can't for three days. Suddenly, our whole vacation is gone. It is past midnight in the Miami airport hmm. with multiple flights canceled to South America and during Art Basel. So oh. there is not a hotel room to be had. We finally find someone to help us. They can't get us all on flights. They can't pull our luggage. You know, but the luggage will go from Miami to L.A. We they, we finally get five seats or six seats to go home on the red eye from Miami back to L.A. And they are spread out all over the plane. There is one business class seat. And one of our friends reaches over and she goes, I'll take that one. So now the rest of us, we've already been traveling the whole day, get, cram ourselves in the back. We had the flight attendant kept yelling at me, and I don't know why. And I'm like, what's your problem? We get home. No one's luggage. We're waiting. They said, don't worry. It'll come. It'll come. It'll come. Okay, okay, okay. It can't get shipped overseas without you being there. Great. We tracked my bag back and forth to the Galapagos three times. They kept shipping my bag to the Galapagos shipping it home, back to Miami. Literally, we were tracking my bag back and forth to South America for at, at least a week, oh if God, not longer. So at least your bag got a vacation. My bag got a vacation, and apparently your bag can travel internationally without you. Wow. I, when was this? This was three years ago. Oh, wow. It was three years ago, five years, uh, three to five years ago. Oh. And it was just like the best of the fact that I got yelled at for absolutely no reason for six hours sitting crammed in a middle seat and coach by a flight attendant who, for whatever reason, decided she didn't like me. So well, I, before I, I let you not to yell at you, thank you. So, so you have a daughter. Yes. Are you giving her a love of travel? Absolutely. Yeah. She's 28. She just got married um, out in, 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 she got married out in Indio. So, and we really like the new husband. Um, he says qualified. He's, as he's, he does the, the, the dad brow furrow. furrow. He's, he's uh, six foot five and a lawyer. <laughs> uh, uh, That's a combination. Yeah. And a good pickleball player, which is nice. So yeah, definitely, definitely uh, teaching. Um, well, she started traveling when she was only three weeks old. 
her first passport photograph, you could actually see my fingers around the back of her head in her passport photograph. I was holding her head like this and, yeah. and you could see her. Yeah. So she's, she's a traveler. She's off on her honeymoon soon. They're traveling over to Japan. So they're super excited about that. So yeah, she definitely loves travel. So my mom, I mean, I traveled all over the world with my parents and my mom um, gave Cooper a huge, my son, a huge love of travel. Mm. And every year you might want to do this eventually when they have kids and you're not necessarily hugely fond of the in-laws. Um, my mom used to do a thing called Grandma Week mm. every week, which was really about 10 days. And they would plan a trip. And I was allowed to go if I wanted to, but I couldn't have an opinion. Ah. Huh. My mom uh, wouldn't let me go, but she gave him this huge love of travel, which was fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's the greatest gift and it's the greatest education. And, um, you know, my grandparents saved up their entire life. The grandparents I told you about who got pulled out of school early and they saved up their entire life for one overseas trip, the trip of a lifetime. And I often remind my daughter you know, we get on these amazing, in these amazing transport machines where these time capsules, where we get in a time capsule and we travel to another destination in a matter of hours, they would, they would be blown away with the life that we lead now, where we're going to all these different countries and experiencing all these different things when they had to save a whole lifetime for one trip. Phil Kogan, Amazing Race, Wednesdays at 9.30 p.m. on CBS. We got to yeah. do this again. I have so much I want to talk to you about. Well, we, we can we can pick this up whenever you, whenever you want. You let me know and we'll carry on the conversation. <laughs>